Welcome. My name is Marika Azoff and I'm the Corporate Engagement Specialist here at the Good Food Institute. Hold on one minute. All right. Um, today I'm stepping in for our corporate engagement assistant, Molly, who, among other things, manages the business side of our GF Ideas community of entrepreneurs, investors, and other professionals in the alt protein industry. So if you want to learn more about GF Ideas, you can visit gfi.com, I'm sorry, gfi.org slash community to learn more about the community. For those of you who don't know, the Good Food Institute is an international nonprofit organization, and we are dedicated to developing the roadmap for a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. So we do that by identifying the most effective solutions, mobilizing resources and talent, and empowering partners across the food systems to make alternative protein accessible, delicious, affordable, and as we like to say, no longer the alternative. So please visit gfi.org to learn more about our work. So before we begin our exciting webinar for the day, I have a few housekeeping items. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel shortly after the presentation. And for all registrants, you will receive an email with a copy of the recording and uh, the slides um, from today's presentation. So keep an eye out for that. And if you wanna view any previous seminars, you can do so on our YouTube channel. Uh, secondly, we will have about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for a Q&A. Um, you can save your questions till the end or write them in the Q&A box as, as we go. Um, please make sure that you use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen instead of the chat. We'll be monitoring that box for questions primarily. So pop those questions in. Um, and now, without further ado, I am so excited to introduce our presenters. Today we have Emma Cahill, Jennifer Wasileski, and Renetta Cooper, who all sit on the food protect protection and preservation team of Kerry Group. So Kerry is an international taste and nutrition company. Kerry is a global leader in the food and beverage space with a direct focus on plant protein um, through both their taste and nutrition division, working through specialty ingredients under the Radical portfolio, as well as their consumer foods business, which brands um, such as Naked Glory and Plant Fire, with brands um, such as Naked Glory and Plant Fire. So today's presentation will focus on food safety and plant-based meat and dairy. Our presenters will cover why food protection is important, healthy and consumer friendly preservative ingredients, how food protection actually works, uh, special considerations for moving pr products from the freezer section to the refrigerated section and much, much more. I'm excited to now turn things over to Emma to kick off the presentation. Thanks, Marika. Um, we are truly live today and we have decided to make this presentation interactive. So you'll see up on your screen a QR code for an app called Mentimeter, or you can go to menti.com and use the code on screen to join. We're going to have four questions throughout the presentation that we would love your input on, three in my section and one coming later in my colleague Renata's section. As promised in the abstract, we're going to give actionable insights to help you unlock food safety in plant-based meat. So my name is Emma Cahill, and I lead strategic marketing for our global food protection and preservation division at Cary. I'm joined by my colleague, Renata Cooper, who leads, leads business development in plant protein, and Jennifer Wasileski, who leads our RDNA team. So my section, from a marketing point of view, is going to help you answer the question of why protecting plant-based meat is important, and does it matter if you use consumer-friendly ingredients? I'm going to pause for a moment and explain what I mean when I say consumer friendly ingredients. You may already be familiar with the term clean label, which is an industry favorite, and sometimes those two things overlap. Consumer friendly in some regions can mean all natural, no artificial preservatives, but it's more than that. It can be about sustainability, economics, and food safety, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So let's look at the global market opportunity 
for plant-based meat alternatives. Markets and Markets predict that the market size is going to grow to 27.9 billion by 2025, and that's coming with double digit growth. So the opportunity in plant-based meat is explosive, and that's why we're here to talk about food safety in plant-based meat today. So I'm gonna go across to Menti, and I would love you to rank these consumer drivers for plant-based meat. So this is your opinion, whether you think the reasons why consumers have turned to plant-based meat is around diet, such as a vegan or vegetarian diet, or reasons such as health and wellness or sustainability. We look at this from a global point of view where there are some differences around the world. So it's great to see um, everybody joining in and uh, all of the different opinions going up and down. So at its inception, the plant-based meat market was likely quite niche and coming from a place of dietary restriction, mostly driven by vegan and vegetarian diets. And then emerged the flexitarian, which is definitely a word I have learned in the last five years. So I'll give you guys another moment to rank these different reasons. But I'm seeing health and wellness as a strong number one, followed by sustainability and the dietary restrictions coming next. Fantastic. Okay, the ranking seems pretty stable. They're not shifting too much anymore. So let's reveal where we're at today around the world. So the number one driver around the world for plant-based meat uh, purchase is actually sustainability. In most regions of the world, the number one trend we see as part of our recent proprietary research is sustainability. But in North America, there is an exception. The number one driver is health and wellness. So what does that mean when you're formulating plant-based meat and you're concerned around food safety? Starting with sustainability, which is such a hot topic in all of our daily lives, consumers who are concerned about sustainability are going to be particularly sensitive to food waste concerns. So if a plant-based meat product expires or has a quality issue before they get to consume it, that's going to be a huge negative in that consumer's mind. Back to health and wellness those consumers are more likely to read ingredient declarations and nutrition statements. So things like no additives or preservative claims and sodium content will really impact their purchase decisions. So as mentioned, dietary restrictions are not the main driver anymore for a plant-based diet. We are seeing that over half of consumers of plant-based meat have a no restriction diet from our own proprietary research called Meet the Challenge. And additionally, Nielsen tells us that 99% of plant-based meat consumers are also buying animal protein for their households. So again, what does that mean when you're formulating plant protein and worried about food safety? It means that those consumers expect to be able to treat a plant protein with the same familiarity and convenience as they do their animal protein that they're preparing for their households. They are not the niche consumer who is willing to give it special treatment, and they can often be disappointed if it perishes quicker or is harder to prepare. Differences in the need uh, for special handling and preparation can lead to food safety issues when a consumer just assumes that they can treat it like animal-based meat. As covered earlier, health and wellness is a huge driver for why people are eating plant-based meat. So plant-based doesn't get a free pass on uh, ingredient labels and nutrition, with over 60% of consumers saying that they frequently read a nutritional panel and ingredient statements. In our recent food safety research, we also unearthed that, that as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, 60% of consumers are saying they're way more concerned about food safety than they were pre-pandemic. So with this in mind, I wanna go back to your phones and ask you a question. Do you feel that food safety in plant-based meat is a consumer concern? Obviously food safety is top of mind from an industry point of view. We're always here to uh, protect consumer health and prevent brand recalls. But do we think it has hit the consumer's radar in plant-based meat? Fantastic, great opinions here. So I do have the answer to this. Kerry very recently launched some proprietary research conducted in North America in this instance with a panel of about a thousand consumers where we wanted to explore consumer understanding of food safety. We did this across all product categories for both in-home and out-of-home consumption, and we were very surprised by the results. So the number one and two 
for in-home consumption in terms of product categories where consumers have the highest level of concern was no surprise to me anyway. It was fresh meat and processed meat. But what came next was a little bit surprising. Our number three, equaling processed meat for consumer concern was other plant-based dairy. So this was everything except non-dairy milk. So plant-based cheese and plant-based yogurts. And right up there in fourth place was plant-based meat alternatives with 49% of consumers expressing a concern around the food safety of these products. So we wanted to know why plant-based meat is so high on a consumer's radar as a food safety concern, outpacing meat-based products like frozen chicken. And we believe this is a combination of unfamiliarity with plant-based meat. So they're not as used to growing up with it. It is probably new and they're not sure how to prepare it. They don't have that reflex or that experience of a, of a sniff test to, to know if it's okay to eat. Combine this with a look at the number of recalls around the world that are hitting the media. So these are just headlines from around the world across plant-based meat and plant-based dairy of recalls that have hit the media and would be uh, within consumer awareness. Add into this some opinion pieces that are out there that have been written for the industry about food safety concerns in the plant-based meat space. And we can understand why this messaging is hitting consumers and they're feeling concerned. So back to your phones, I'd love to hear from you what is top of mind when you hear a food safety recall announced in the media? Is it a contamination? Is it something like an undeclared allergen or mislabeling? Or is it about foreign materials? This can be your own gut reaction or what you hear about most in the media. I would say for me, and it may be down to personal experience, foreign materials are maybe more of an industry concern and may not be hitting um, consumer awareness until it makes the headlines. But here the numbers are really aligning with what we see when we look at industry data. So I combed through the recalls over the last five years from both the USDA and the FDA here in North America. And both in meat and in food, the number one reason for product recalls in food and beverage was contamination, as perfectly captured um, by your inputs in the mentee, which is great. So if we look at the FDA, because we're talking about plant-based meat here, so not animal-based meat under USDA, and we dig into the recalls due to contamination, and we visualize them here in a word cloud, what stands out is potential contamination with listeria and salmonella. So these are pathogens associated with food poisoning or food safety risks. And this is a clear call out to why consumers are concerned about food safety and why we need to do something to address any food safety gaps to improve consumer trust in plant-based meat. So that we know that consumers are concerned with food safety, we also ask them as part of the same survey upon who the responsibility lies to ensure food safety. Their answer was resounding that it lies with the industry. The pain also relies on the er the pain of a recall also hits the industry, with data showing that the average cost of a recall is $10 million, and that doesn't capture the additional brand damage and potential loss of sales. So from a food safety point of view, it helps for brand protection and also protecting consumer health, and it's really, really important that the industry takes food safety seriously and addresses any gaps that could be uh, potentially there in terms of plant protein. With that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Renata Cooper. Thanks, Emma. Emma is taking you through why one needs to look at options related to food safety and plant-based meat alternatives. I'll be helping you to better understand when to build food safety and food protection into your formulations, when to start, when it's really a requirement. Addressing this early in development process is really important. It will allow you to move quickly and successfully to market with your creative and exciting plant-based meat alternatives. So we're going to switch over to another mentee. So as, as we start to talk about this, we want to look at food, how, how we should build food protection in. And the question I wanted to ask you is whether it should be fresh, what's growing more quickly? Is it fresh or frozen? As you answer this question, I'd like to give you a little information that we've gotten from Nielsen data and from the Good Food Institute reports. Today, plant-based, the plant-based protein market in the US 
is estimated to be 57% frozen. IRI data shows us that refrigerated plant-based meat alternative products sales are outpacing frozen um, as of June, 2020. With the market seeing a sales increase of approximately 70% in the refrigerated plant-based category between June of 2019 and June of 2020. With fresh meat alternatives being, being increasingly sold in the meat aisle alongside of traditional meat products, it's exciting to see this level of growth. The, the category did particularly well during the pan pandemic, experiencing high growth at 454% versus the same week of 2019. And then finally, data, data essentials is telling us that the majority of consumers are feeling less safe about buying meat during the pandemic. And we, can, we believe that the con continued growth in plant-based based products is likely to be in, in the refrigerated aisle. So I can see from your answers here that you agree with the information that we've seen, um, that there is likely to be a much greater increase, increase in the refrigerated section. So starting fresh, um, what's, a, what's different about starting fresh? Um, I think that we see um, this is a, a really rapidly growing space. Um, it is important to, to partner early in order to, to get the best outcome. Um, as you move into the refrigerated space. And what I mean by that is to really reach out to your ingredient suppliers um, to help you move into that space. It's important that you, you start during your concept development, um, in particular, when the goal is to develop a, a refrigerated product, it's the perfect time for you to start that partnership. Partnering early offers the best and quickest outcome. As most plant-based meat alternatives are high in moisture and have a relatively neutral pH, it's highly likely that you are going to need a clean label antimicrobial if you want to achieve a shelf life of greater than seven to 10 days. Carry itself, when it decided to do some development in, in plant-based items, um, when we developed our, our, our chicken nugget alternate, um, we did decide early on to build food protection into that core product. Um, we did want to achieve greater than 10 days shelf life. We understood by doing that, we would overcome any problems that were related to taste and texture before we looked at adding the required flavoring systems. So it is very important um, to get, get that right to begin with. Um, I did want to point out in the center of the screen, this is actually what we call the food safety flow chart. Um, it's an internal proprietary tool that we're happy to share with you um, on specific issues. It allows us to look at the raw materials and the processing that's used in product development, understanding what the concerns are, addressing each of the, the potential sources of contamination and making decisions as we move the, through that process, understanding how the product is going to be heat treated as well as packaged so that we can uncover what are the potential hurdles in developing a long shelf life that is, is safe. Um, so really the important thing here is asking the right questions early. So a little bit more of a challenge is if you're actually moving from frozen to fresh. Um, you do wanna understand your current formulation and understand that there's actually anything already in that formula that would be helpful to deliver food protection. Um, it is a bit more of a challenge because you have that base formula that, that you're starting with. And it's inherent, if you're starting with a frozen fermentation, that you're going to have some challenges that you need to unravel as you try to move that formula from frozen to refrigerated. It's really important to understand each of the ingredients that you already have in your formula. What's the purpose or function of that ingredient in your formula? Is it is it going to continue to be important if you move to a refrigerated format? Or do you have some components in there that are specifically related to giving a good shelf life on a frozen product specifically? It actually creates an opportunity for you to better understand the functionality of each of the ingredients and potentially remove things um, that may not be required, required in a refrigerated format. Really looking at the gaps and how you could build, bridge the gaps in your current formulation to create a product that is very similar, but has a longer refrigerated shelf life. It would be also be good to really understand what your spoilage issues are. They may not have been things that you considered in the past when you were making a frozen product. 
and you didn't really have to be concerned about the outgrowth of those spoilage organisms. And, and then also addressing any potential issues with flavor and texture. It's one of the challenges that you see when you're starting with a frozen, frozen product that you didn't have to really account for um, any kind of off flavors or texture issues that your antimicrobial might also bring in. So you do need to account for those as soon as possible. It does make a, a greater challenge when you're moving from frozen to fresh. And, and really the underlying question that you wanna make sure that you're, you're covering is what will really need, need to be provided in order to give you the refrigerated shelf life that you're looking for. So how can you do this? There's a number of ways that we've looked at doing this and, and it's interesting. And I think that there are benefit, different benefits with each of these options. One of them is to build the clean label preservation into your actual base material. We think this is a really good starting point. If you build it into that base material and you account for any kind of flavor or texture um, differences that the um, antimicrobial may, may bring, um, it, it helps you to start with a, cl a cleaner place to build from. So build in early, um, it's an approach that we've taken. Um, it, it's actually just built into your, your white mass. Another way of building your clean label antimicrobial would, would be to be integrate it into your flavor system, whether that's a masking system or the seasoning blends that you're using in your product. Um, this is really helpful um, because it gives you your operators one less step. So everything can go in at one time. And then you have confidence that that food safety has actually built, been built in um, and you're covered from that perspective. So it's just one, one system that covers both your your flavor requirements, any masking requirements that you might have, as well as the clean label antimicrobial. Um, next would be a multi-ingredient system. Um, they are available either in liquid or dry um, solutions. And in this particular case, you're, you're trying to target additive benefits. Um, so you're looking for multiple um, coverage of spoilage organisms or, or pathogens. Um, it is typically added separately and it's added to your base material. And then you would add your seasonings and flavors on top of that. And then finally, if you have a formula that's fairly complete, you can look at applying single ingredients. Um, so those single ingredients are also um, av available both in liquid and dry formats. It really depends on your process and, and the ease of handling that you might be looking for, um, what option you would wanna go with. Um, in general, a single component system doesn't give you as broad of coverage as you might see with a system. Um, so it's really understanding the spectrum of inhibition that you need for your formula. So really the goal here is to understand what your challenges are and to make sure we're also meeting the consumer demand, um, especially if you're looking to develop something that might have some potential outside of the U.S. and really looking for a, the ability to have things that can be manufactured in the U.S. and sold in another region. Um, so really looking at what those consumer-friendly ingredients can be combined with both taste and preservation expertise. So if we look first at the customer challenge. So the challenges that you have in developing a food product um, based on a plant protein shelf life is a challenge and what we're really talking about today, but some additional challenge that you would face would be taste and nutrition. Um, and we've talked a little bit about how antimicrobials can impact flavor and you wanna account for that early. Um, we see that one of the challenges can be really to make sure that you're meeting that consumer desired clean label or friendly ingredient deck, um, making sure that if there are any restrictions um, on what ingredients that you can put into your products that those are understood. Um, sodium reduction, sodium has been an issue in a lot of plant-based products in the past and looking and trying to find ways to reduce that. And then of course, you always need to be meeting the, um, the regulatory requirements, whether those be regional or global. And, and doing it at the same time and marrying them up to what we see consumers looking for. So really freshness and convenience, they want that product to last longer, particular if it's in the frozen section, I'm sorry, the refrigerated section, how long can we make that product have a really high quality so that when the consumer takes it home, they can keep it in their refrigerator for a number of days. Um, tying into sustainability, really that reduction of food rate waste. So the longer shelf life that we have, the more opportunity for the consumer to enjoy that product, we will reduce um, food waste. 
Um, they should be trusted ingredients um, and they have the same taste and quality or appeal that they would see um, in more familiar products. So really looking to meet both the challenges that you have as well as the demands that we're seeing from consumers. So one thing that we like to do, and I particularly like to do this with people who are newer to our group or, or new grads, is actually to do some supermarket marketing. Um, so I think that it, there's just so much to be learned from simply going to your grocery store and seeing what products are available on the shelves today and trying to understand what makes them attractive to consumers, um, looking at the, the ingredient label, um, looking for best by dates. Um, the, in some places you can find actually what plant it was manufacturer, manufacturer, manufactured in. It, look really carefully at the packaging. What does that tell you about it? And, and why does that appeal to your consumer? Or what kind of food protection is the packaging actually giving to that product? Um, and then clearly the ability to look at how do these products compare in price? Um, we find that um, the, the categories, the labels will fall into a number of ca categories. You'll find products in the store, plant-based alternatives today that may have no preservative, um, or they may have some natural preservatives to protect during the, the, the consumer thought before cooking. So there is some of that out there already. It's good to see what competition is already doing. Um, we do see in very rare cases, especially in um, plant protein, um, the use of artificial preservatives. It, it's not very common, but there are some that have been launched in this space. Um, and it doesn't really necessarily align very well with, with what we believe consumers are looking for with respect to label decks. Um, there are a number of products in the market that have consumer friendly pres preservatives. Um, and these ingredients have a spectrum, there's a spectrum of them, a spectrum of them that are allowed. Um, and, and that does vary across regions. So important to note, note that. Um, finally, there are products in the market that actually aren't using a clean label preservative, and the way that those products are be get, being get, given a longer shelf life is really through the processing, um, something like high pressure processing is being used, and the packaging that is being applied to that product, whether it's an overwrap, vacuum packaging, or modified atmosphere. Um, what's important to, to understand that if you don't see a preservative on the label deck, um, there is no secondary shelf life when you open that package. So all of the food protection is actually coming from the packaging. So one of the things that it's important to see what you, to understand what you're seeing on the label, as well as what you don't see on the label. So if you're seeing a product um, that is packaged very well, it could be vacuum packed, it could be modified atmosphere packaging, but it contains no antimicrobial, then all likely, in all of the likelihood, it doesn't have a very long shelf life. And, and there's probably no secondary shelf life after that package is open. So there's, imagine that you've gone to the, the grocery store, you've looked at hundreds of label docs and you're trying to understand this myriad of things that you see and, and what do they mean? Um, so this is a word cloud of all of the things that you might've seen on those label docs and trying to understand how, how are they actually affecting um, the ability of that product to be shelf stable or have a longer shelf life. And so how can we translate those, those ingredients into something that you can work with? So I wanted to give you a frame of reference um, and provide some focus areas on where things are different and what options are available. And, and we like to, to do this in, a, in sort of a quantitative way um, to give you a frame of reference, really looking at what's good, what might be better, and what's best in class. So if we start with artificial preservatives, and as I mentioned, you don't see those commonly used in plant-based alternatives, there are some benefits. They are inexpensive, but they're not particularly label-friendly. Label and just to quickly go through the, the other criteria that we wanted to evaluate against is understanding their compliance, not just in the US, um, but globally, if you wanted to move outside of the region, another good thing about um, artificial preservatives is they're very good um, in, at inhibiting pathogens as well as spoilage organisms. So some very promising and good reasons to be looking at artificial preservatives. They don't score particularly well in the area of sustainability because they're typically synthetic. Um, so they wouldn't really fit in that space. They don't really do much for you with respect to giving you 
um, or protecting your flavor at, at end of shelf life. They do a great job at pathogens and spoiler drug is nothing that's really going to help you with respect to off flavor development. Um, they don't contribute um, to particularly um, high levels of sodium because their use rates are very low. But again, the biggest drawback um, to artificial preservatives in this space is really the label friendliness and whether or not the consumer of a plant-based alternative would recognize or, or like to see a product with an artificial preservative. Um, so if we go to single ingredients, um, I'm not gonna touch on all of them, just call out the high points here. Um, single ingredients, they, they do cost a little bit more. Um, they definitely, this is clean label single ingredients. Um, they do much better in the area of being label friendly. Um, they have some, some compliance. If you're using a single ingredient, it's unlikely to be complied in every region of the world. That's very challenging. Um, but they do a really good job on pathogens. Um, they do a fairly good job um, on spoilage organisms. They fit into that state sustainability space because we're looking at single components that are either based on fermentation from a re renewable resource or plant extract. So they fit really nicely into this category. Um, again, they don't have a lot of play on helping flavor at the end of shelf life. In some cases, they are fairly high in sodium, but they do fit the bill a little bit better with respect to whether or not your consumer would accept seeing that ingredient on the label deck. So the next category is really a functional system where you're building a multi-component system to address things more broadly. We think this is a really good approach um, and hits a, a number of the, these things and doesn't have any really negative callouts. Um, they are more expensive than artificial preservatives. Um, you can expand your ability to have glo global compliance. They still check the box with respect to label friendliness, um, but it does give you an expanded inhibition against both pathogens and spoilage organisms by looking at a system. If you're looking at a system, it does give you the ability to build some functionality into the system that will help you with flavor at the end of shelf life. Um, so not just the antimicrobial aspects, but some preventing some of the other off flavors. Um, again, they can be fairly low sodium, so it kind of ticks that box as well. Um, and the consumer acceptance is, is really going to be high with these um, combination systems that are clean label and, and, and friendly in appearance. So we wanted to make the comparison to frozen. Um, so we're not, you know, obviously frozen isn't, doesn't have a cost by itself, but frozen, freezing the product and the distri distribution of the, the frozen product is probably going to add more cost um, than an anti, uh, excuse me, an antimicrobial in, and in particular um, artificial. So you have a cost impact there. Um, if you're freezing it, you don't necessarily need to use an antimicrobial. So um, that's a very um, label friendly way to go about that. No issues with regulations. I think where we see um, a real drawback from continuing in the frozen space is that consumers are really looking for something that's refriger refrigerated um, and the convenience of that refrigerated product. There are some processing technologies um, that are very clean label. Um, high pressure processing would be one example. Um, the drawback to that is that it is quite expensive as compared to an ingredient technology for food safety. It does a great job of hitting all of the other boxes um, with respect to, to, to label friendliness, compliance, food safety, pathogen inhibition. Um, the biggest drawback there is really that it has no secondary um, shelf life after opening and, and the actual cost contribution. Um, so I'm really just trying to give you an overview of the technologies that are available. Um, and a, a frame of reference so that you can look at this and see, you know, what kind of approach might be best for the brand that I'm developing for. So just to touch a little bit more on the factors within the formulation and the environment. So we're going to be talking a lot about clean label antimicrobials, um, and those are really the intrinsic things that you can do within your formulation. Um, to add food safety. But in addition to that, you really want to understand pH, salt, and water activity. All of those things have a, a really big role to play in how well this product is going to help hold up at a refrigerated temperature. You also want to understand what are the intrinsic factors that are affecting your product. Those are things that are outside of the product, it, the packaging, um, the times and temperatures, 
that are years, do, used during its processing, how it's stored, how it ships. So all of the other factors that affect your product. Um, so those two, two things in combination, um, a good understanding of those will help you design a product with a, a very good shelf life. So this is, is a very important um, slide in when we're looking to formulate um, and looking at the hurdles that one can put in place um, to develop a product with a long shelf life. Um, adding a preservative ingredient alone doesn't really guarantee an optimum shelf life and food safety performance. It's really looking at all of those things, temperature, water activity, pH. How can you control those within your formulation to give that product the best chance lower pH, lower water activity tend to result in something with a longer shelf life. And then what are your options around clean label preservation? We really think that partnering with the ingredient supplier, getting their understanding of how you can adjust water activity, how you can adjust pH within your formulation, and then finally picking and selecting the best clean label antimicrobial for the product that you're trying to develop. Thanks, Renetta. So today, Emma has shared with you why food safety matters for plant-based alternatives. And Renetta has explained to you when you should start thinking about food safety interventions in your process. Now I'll be taking you through how to identify your food protection needs and how to validate that your solution works as you formulate your products for the refrigerated space. There are four primary food safety hazards that you need to be concerned about when formulating a food product, and controlling those hazards are how you prevent foodborne illness. The physical, allergenic, and chemical hazards would be covered by your quality team, and controls should be built into your HACCP plants. So our focus today will be on the biological risk and how food protection ingredients can help you control this hazard. When it comes to determining the shelf life of food products, developers need to consider the sensory attributes such as color and flavor, but most importantly, they need to understand the spoilage related to microbial growth. And the strategies needed to address these microbial issues will be more challenging and complex than those needed to overcome organoleptic changes. Microbial spoilage can be broken down into two distinct categories, food pathogens, which are bacteria that will make you sick, and food spoilage microorganisms, which will just make the food organoleptically unappetizing, such as the mold growing on your bread or cheese. It's important to note that just because you have interventions that can control one category, it does not mean that you are capable of controlling the other category. So as Renetta mentioned, it's important to build multiple hurdles into your food system to ensure you have a robust process. Many food companies use best before dates to designate the end of a product's optimal quality whereas use by dates indicate when a product may no longer be safe to eat. Use by dates are determined by performing microbial challenge studies. These studies are performed in a lab and where the food company intentionally applies the microbe of concern into the food product. The food is then stored under specific packaging and storage conditions and the growth of the microbe is monitored. The purpose of these microbial challenge studies is to understand how quickly your undesirable microbes would grow to unacceptable levels and helps the food manufacturer determine how long the food product would be considered safe if it were to inadvertently be contaminated during the manufacturing process. Before choosing a food protection and quality solution, it's important to understand what your microbial challenges will be. There's two possible sources where the bacteria can enter your process, either through your raw materials or through your manufacturing environment. In this slide, I will walk through a comparison of the microbial risks between animal and plant protein products. Because both products have high moisture and close to neutral pH, they make a great growing environment for bacteria, so we shouldn't be surprised that the risks are quite similar between them. When we look at the raw materials, the microbial risks are similar because they are both coming from agricultural sources. While there may be some differences based on processing, the starting materials are still coming from the farm and fields. This means your mag major pathogen concerns would be spore formers such as Clostridium botulinum or Clostridium perfringens. And you'll also have the risk of vegetative pathogens such as Salmonella, Listeria monocytogenase, and E. coli 0157H7. While most plant-based alternatives are produced using an extrusion process, which is high temperature and high pressure, 
that would be capable of reducing the microbial load. There are some studies which indicate spores such as Clostridium are capable of surviving this process. So you'll want to ensure you have hurdles in place to control it. And when we consider the spoilage bacteria risks from raw materials, again, there are similarities, but the differentiating factor comes down to packaging. If your product is stored in a, a vacuum pack or modified atmospheric, atmospheric packaging, you could potentially have issues with enterobacteriaceae and lactic acid bacteria. But if you weren't using matte packaging or vacuum packaging and your product was stored in an aerobic environment, then Pseudomonas would be a, a spoilage organism of concern for you to be worried about. And as we move into the manufacturing, in manufacturing environment, both animal and plant protein products have validated heat treatment processes, which would reduce the microbial load. So the contamination risks we have listed here would be due to post heat treatment contamination. Your pathogen, pathogen risk at this step in the process would be salmonella and listeria monocytogenes and spoilage again from enterobacteriaceae and lactic acid bacteria. It's also important to note that some manufacturing facilities may also be shared. For example, a meat manufacturing plant could also be producing plant-based protein products. So ensuring good manufacturing practices are in place will reduce the potential for cross-contamination to occur. Kerry has a broad portfolio of food protection ingredients ranging from plant extracts to fermentation metabolites to vinegar-based solutions and protective cultures. Based on your level of experience with food safety, this is where we can really be a resource for you. Our expertise is in leveraging this expansive portfolio in partnership with our taste technology business to build functional, clean label, antimicrobial systems that solve even the most complex food protection and food quality challenges. We partner with our customers to understand the risk within their food products and have the ability to perform the microbial challenge studies needed to generate data that shows our ingredients work in the way our customers need them to. And you'll have most success in solving your food safety and food quality challenges by partnering with your ingredient suppliers early in the development process. Here's an example of a microbial challenge study that was performed in a plant-based burger patty. Listeria was chosen for the study because it's been a challenge for the refrigerated food industry as it's capable of growing at refrigeration temperatures where other bacteria are unable to grow. The threshold at which we would consider food unsafe for Listeria is at the three log mark, which is shown by the dotted black line. The red line that you see going up represents the meat analog with no preservatives added. And it shows that Listeria's growth can exceed the limit of one log after only seven days of storage at proper refrigeration temperatures. And it will continue to grow over a month's storage. However, with only the addition of a small amount of vinegar powder at 0.5%, which is represented by the green line, you are able to control the outgrowth of Listeria for at least 33 days. These types of studies help manufacturers determine that their food is safe. And you can see that even a small amount of a clean label preservative can make a big difference and also increase the shelf life of the product by at least three weeks, which additionally reduces the need to discard food and reduce food waste. As mentioned before, when determining the shelf life of a food product, the developer not only needs to consider the risks from pathogenic bacteria, but also those from spoilage bacteria that would negatively impact color and texture and taste as they begin to grow. Here is another a microbial challenge study which was performed in a plant-based burger patty again. If in this study, we were focused on identifying a solution to control a mixture of lactic acid bacteria and enterococcus spoilage organisms. Two different solutions were evaluated. One was a single ingredient solution of organic acids, and the other was a functional system comprising of organic acids and carbonyls. When it comes to spoilage bacteria, a level of six log CFU per gram would be considered spoilage. And again, that's designated by the black dotted line. Both antimicrobial solutions were effective at delaying the outgrowth of the spoilage bacteria as compared to the control, which spoiled roughly at day seven. While you may be thinking that an increase of four days may not seem significant, you also need to consider that this is a challenge study where the bacteria was intentionally added at a high level, in this case, three log. In a production environment, the levels of contamination would be much lower. So the treatments uh, with the antimicrobials would prevent the spoilage for much longer than 11 days. But for the purposes of this study, it is telling us that the antimicrobials chosen 
are capable of extending the product's shelf life and either one could be selected as they have similar performance. Whether you have a product today that's frozen and you're looking to move into the refrigerated space or you're working on developing a new refrigerated product for the market, we would recommend taking an integrated approach. The first step is to identify your challenges and goals. And this starts with deciding on what your application will be and considering how it would be processed. You'll need to set a target for your shelf life goals, understand the regional regulations on where you're planning to sell the product, and consider if there are certain ingredients that you do or do not want on your label. All of this information that will feed into your cost targets. Once you have the initial goals and targets in place, you'll move into the technical considerations. And this is the best time to start engaging with your food protection ingredient supplier. Together, you can perform the biological risk assessment related to the formulation, processing, and packaging. And that information then will be critical for the supplier to understand what ingredients in their portfolio would be most appropriate for your application goals. Once that solution's been identified, then you'll work together to determine which type of tests should be performed in order to confirm that you've met your success criteria. In most cases, it will be a microbial challenge study. The question is, are you able to do that yourself? Or is there a third party study that you'll need to engage with? Or does your ingredient supplier have the capabilities to help you with that? Ultimately, before you launch your product, you'll want to validate your solution with a production trial. There's a diverse range of spoilage organisms in the Enterobacteriaceae and lactic acid bacteria families, which will be introduced into your product through your production facility. And a trial at the production scale is the way to truly test out performance of your food safety and food spoilage solution. And after this work is completed, you'll have full confidence in the success of your new product launch. Now I'll be passing it back to Emma, who will wrap up our conversation for today. Thanks, Jennifer. So as promised in the abstract, we wanted to deliver to you some actionable insights around food safety to help protect consumer health, prevent product recalls, and ensure brand protection. This falls under the headline of protecting food, and we believe that solving challenges is about more than ingredients. In addition to that, we wanted to cover how to get products from the freezer to the refrigerator, the scientific approach to adding hurdles covered by Jennifer. But as you've seen today, the opportunity is much greater than that. It's about shelf life extension and preservation. This is a huge opportunity to improve the sustainability of plant-based protein by reducing food waste. As well as this, we can look at the sustainability of the processes, looking at making them more efficient through cost reduction and another opportunity for shelf life extension. And that switch to clean label, consumer friendly ingredients that are so important to consumers around the world, ensuring you're able to use ingredients from nature that are backed by science. An extra layer given by expertise with partners who can deliver more uh, from your product is tackling challenges that are more complex, like delivering taste, nutrition and appeal, protecting flavor over shelf life, reducing sodium or ensuring the craveability of your plant based burger. As we said, sodium reduction is a common challenge in the plant-based space. You might need help with flavor enhancement or access to no and low sodium preservation solutions. There's lots of ambitious plant protein brands out there and tackling global and regional expansion can be challenging. Looking for compliance, you need regulatory expertise and a global supply chain you can trust. So with that, I'll hand over to Marika for the Q&A section. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Emma, Renetta, and Jennifer for that value packed, wonderful presentation. A lot of incredibly helpful info in there. I'm glad that this is recorded <laughs> so that our audience can go back and refer to it as much as possible. We have a lot of wonderful questions. So I'm just gonna kind of pick at random. We have 10 minutes um, and we'll start with a question, um, an anonymous question. Do you know at what point there is a change in perception from a chilled product, which is fresh, to something which is artificially extended? Can too much chilled shelf life be perceived as a negative? I believe Emma's going to answer this question. Thanks, Marika. Um, so I'll start with saying that this is around consumer sentiments, which are subjective, which is why Carrier constantly launching uh, updated consumer research to probe into what makes consumers tick. So the best answer I have is based on the personas of consumers that are consuming plant-based meat today. They're looking for a convenience that fits into their lives. So they want to be able to treat it like meat. So I would say the starting point is being able to match the shelf life that you get from meat. 
we hear anecdotally from consumers as part of our panels, they took something out of the freezer and, you know, from a convenience and busy life point of view, they didn't get to cook it right away and they left it in the refrigerator for two or three days and saw it deteriorate. And they said, oh, my meat product would have been fine for two days in the fridge. Why is it not the same? So our, our best benchmark here, because it is, it is subjective in consumers' minds, is at least matching the familiar experience in terms of shelf life with meat. And we do a lot of research, especially in my division, in understanding consumer understanding of preservatives. And the short answer is they don't fully understand them. They know that preservatives are scary and they see things in the media with unfamiliar names and some of them even come with potential health risks. Um, but they don't understand what ingredients are in there from a preservation point of view. So that's why consumer friendly labels and education can help. It's that trust piece where the consumer picks up the package, looks at the ingredients, feels that they're familiar and trustworthy and that the shelf life is long enough to fit into their lives, but not long enough to be completely suspicious. There you go. Thank you so much for answering that, Emma. Um, so we had a couple questions on fermentation and this one, uh, is is longer, but the the meat of it, no <laughs> pun intended, is um, is it possible to sorry, is it possible to provide truly fresh, um, preservative-free, plant-based meat products to the population? I don't know if anyone wants to take that one. I would say Renetta, would you be best place to give that one a go? Certainly, Emma. So is it truly possible to provide fresh plant-based meat products to the consumer? So I think it touches back a little bit on what Emma said is trying to make sure we understand what is fresh um, in the eyes of the consumer. Um, and I think there's this window. Um, I think there are a lot of products that have very long shelf life, um, but they do tend to lose quality over time. So it would be good to find that balance um, between a high quality product with an appearance and flavor that is what ex is expected and the shelf life is, is reasonable. Um, that, I, that I believe is very achievable. Um, if you think back to the slide that Jennifer showed um, with the challenge studies, um, having something that is, is only going to last three or four days versus something that is going to last 10, I think those are the windows of opportunity where you can have um, a good shelf life, so longer than three or four days, um, but not so long that you're starting to see quality, um, that it really doesn't give you the impression that that product is fresh. Thank you so much. Um, I I just to jump in there, I think also, because I, I know the comment of fermented products, um, while this isn't an area that I'd say I have a lot of expertise on, um, if we consider, say, fresh vegetables um, that get stored in a frozen format, the reason they have to be blanched prior to that is because enzymes are actually certain ones are still active at the frozen temperature. Um, so I would see to answer the question about an unpasteurized fermented product that you would need to perform your own shelf life studies to make sure that the enzymes that are still active in your, in your culture um, are not active at a frozen temperature, but we do know enzymes can be active even at low temperatures like that. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, another one for um, Emma is, sorry. Um, do you know at what, oh, I already asked that one. My apologies. <laughs> Just trying to make sure I cover all areas. Uh, we have a question about organic products. Um, if we produce all raw materials in alternative meat organically, can we call it organic alternative meat? Um, how can we ensure the authenticity of the um, produced alternative meat as organic? That might be a question for our regulatory team, to be honest. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I did see one come through um, that how could we effectively communicate that a product has no secondary shelf life without discouraging a consumer from buying it? And this is not unique to the plant-based space. 
So you will see a lot of products come through, you know, across all categories of food and beverage that might be on ambient storage until they're opened. And then once they're opened, there's a message on the packet, refrigerate after opening, um, you know, that will keep for seven days after shelf life. Usually in condiments, this can be very surprising to consumers. That's something that can be ambient um, and closed and live in their cupboard for one year. Once it's opened, they'll be, you know, used within one week, used within 30 days. So I would say that that's the most effective way to communicate this to consumers without putting them off from buying it. Um, and it's things like processes and map packaging that might give you that shelf life um, that's there until it's opened and then just effectively communicating what shelf life is there after it's opened. So it's not a surprise. Thank you, Emma. That was the one I was looking for. You could see me fan frantically scrolling to find it. Um, and now we have a, a question that you mentioned this a couple of times in the presentation. Just why is sodium reduction a problem? Okay, I will start this and my technical colleagues can, can jump in and uh, help me out. But essentially, it's not only about you know, adding salt for taste. A lot of the preservatives out there are sodium-based, so they do contribute sodium to the final formulation. So if you're already using sodium or sodium-based products to enhance the taste of plant-based, because if consumers are trying to replicate that animal meat experience, they're used to quite salty um, processed meats in my experience. You're trying to protect the taste, but match the nutritionals to consumer expectations. So if your preservative solution is adding, adding further sodium, it can put sodium above the threshold. We even see this in certain markets where there are regulations to limit the amount of sodium per 100 grams of product, for example. So we are always looking to provide solutions that have no and low sodium contribution. So when you're formulating, you only have to, to worry about the taste contribution of sodium in a positive way versus extra sodium coming in from your preservative solution. Um, but Jennifer and Ada, feel free to add to your own comments. Um, I think you've covered it well. Thank you. Great. Um, and I guess this probably will be our last question. Um, can you provide examples of functional systems and when AM typically applied at food production plants? Not sure I actually, does that make sense? It does. <laughs> okay, it's not my expertise. That's okay. So I think the question is asking about combinations of ingredients that might be seeking to have that additive effect um, for shelf life. And I would say AM stands for antimicrobials in the question. Um, so do you guys want to let me go with this or one of you jump in? I'll keep going. So, um, so these can be combinations that have different modes of action on, uh, spoilage or pathogenic, uh, microbials. So we could combine solutions that are, are made from, from different things like fermentation or from plants. So it could be a combination of vinegar with carbonyls, like you saw in the data that Jennifer presented. Um, things that are like peptide based or organic acid based. Um, I'm trying to think of other great examples here, but the idea is that you're um, having an action in two ways. So something that might have a really strong impact on pathogens combined with something else that has a really strong impact on mold and yeast and other spo spoilage microorganisms are coming together and completing each other with a, an additive like one plus one equals three kind of or just coming together in a positive way um, to help protect and extend shelf life. And the idea of using two solutions together is they usually can come in at lower dosage. Um, so have a better impact on sensory nutritionals than a strong dose of one single ingredient. Thank you so much. Um, and I know we're at time. So I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. They're amazing questions. Um, and I just wanted to thank you again to our wonderful presenters for sharing your time and expertise with us. I know I learned a lot. Um, and as a reminder, just be on the lookout for our post webinar email um, and be sure to check out gfi.org slash events to stay up to date with all GFI events and other industry events of interest. And our next webinar will be on May 13th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be joined by industry consultant Mark Warner to discuss contract manufacturing and fermentation. And we'll also be hosting a state of the industry webinar series in May, which will share key insights from our forthcoming state of the industry reports for each pillar of, our, of alternative proteins. We look forward to seeing you next month. Have a wonderful day and thank you again to Carrie and our presenters.